Today, we are honored to sit down with futurist Jim Carroll. Jim shares his experiences and lessons gained over an incredible 33-year speaking career. Jim's clients have ranged from Daimler Chrysler to NASA, and he advises CEOs and C-suite executives from the top companies around the world on future trends, on what is coming and what they need to prepare for in order to survive and thrive. Jim also shares with us how he maintains an incredibly busy schedule of international travel and how he keeps a balance in his life between work and family and what he prioritizes. If you're an executive, if you're a business owner, this one is definitely for you and should not be missed. Welcome to Coffee and Conversations with Champions, the Leadership Edition. Our recording, fantastic. So Jim, it is a huge honor. Hang on, you know, I have to be a nerd and do this. <laughs> it's a huge honor to have you on the show, Jim Carroll, futurist. And uh, I mean, you are, you have been world renowned for over three decades, not, not to give your, your age away. And um, it, it means a great deal to me to have you on the show. And you, you've helped me tremendously in nurturing and building my, my career. And uh, it's meant a lot. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are? Who is Jim? Uh, so I'm a futurist. I, I focus on tomorrow and trends and um, th things like that. And I've been on the speaking circuit for close to 33 years. Yeah. Uh, I've had clients like NASA, like Disney, Johnson & Johnson, Pfizer, Mercedes-Benz, you know, just sure. these uh, um, PGA clients where I'm uh, PGA of America. I'm a big golfer. So that was kind of a thrill. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I've had a room full of astronauts to advise them about the future of space. I, I'm, you know, one of those guys who... I don't think fit into the traditional career boxes, even though I'm an accountant by background uh, and really am sort of dragging organizations and their executives kicking and screaming into tomorrow um, by providing, you know, insight on, you know, look, here's the reality of what comes next and what you need to do about it. Right. That's absolutely fantastic. What led you into this, into this career? How did you end up um, as a futurist? And then from that, I mean, Total. into speaking. Hmm. Total, total accident. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, a chartered accountant, CPA, whatever we're called, you know, this week. Uh, I was, um, you know, with predecessor firms of KPMG and Ernst & Young from 79 to 89, um, doing audit advisory business, you know, advisory taxation, exciting stuff like that. But look, I got online uh, in 1982 uh, on an old Radio Shack computer with a 300 baud modem. The youngsters won't even understand what that is. And so wow. I was probably on the I was probably on the internet, you know, ten years, twelve years before a good chunk of the population was, and I saw what was coming, and I realized that look, I'm going to have a lot more fun getting involved in this global technology connectivity trend than I will working with debits and credits. So I just started evolving more into the technology sphere, and it all sort of hit ahead in March of 1994, 30 years ago, when I wrote a little book mm. with another guy. Uh, about the internet and it, it ended up in three weeks in Canada. I'm Canadian. Um, it ended up within three weeks being a number one national bestseller. And he and I, wow. you know, we were like the Lennon and McCartney of the Canadian internet. We ended up in the five years writing 34 books. We sold a million books, just crazy life TV shows. And I'm on the radio and in the media and newspaper crews coming to my house. And then I got tired of that gig and I was looking around and realizing I'm talking about trends, the future. So, Hey, guess what? I'm a futurist. Um, All right. Sort of went from there. Okay. Fantastic. I think we, we met, um, sort of just <laughs> during online, during COVID during with COVID. The, the platform we're, we're using now called Ecamm. I mean, which was, which was great, but for you, that, that was quite a big shift because, um, I recall in our conversations where you spoke, you sort of said the, the focus was more on for corporate events, on inclusion and all of these, the d diversity and these kind of things. What happened? What kept you focused and motivated? Because I think to, to, to use an overused term, I mean, you've blown up again, you know, like you, it's going crazy. Like you really, I mean, you're working hard. 
I mean, you're all, where, I, where have I, you I, been I'm so a, far this year, by the way? I, I'm a huge fan of optimism. And when, I mean, right. when COVID yeah. hit, you know, I, I, I did this, I built a big, you know, green screen, virtual broadcast studio in my basement. And I mean, I can flip into my spaceship. I can right. pull up a different scene. I can, you know, jump into a, you know, an entirely different thing. I, I realized, you know, within one week of COVID, uh, you know, I can sit around and, you know, be depressed and my business of, you know, going out on stages and commanding, mm. you know, five figure feet come to an end. I can sit around and be depressed about that, or I can reinvent again. And it's actually funny. My sons who are now 28 and 30, uh, said to their mom, like, what's dad going to do, you know, with lockdown? And she said, well, he'll just reinvent. I mean, he does that. Um, right. And so immediately within a week, I was building, you know, a virtual broadcast studio and migrated to the software called Ecamm Live, which you were using. And, you know, we yep. met in a Facebook group where a whole bunch of other, uh, you know, sort of digital refugees were meeting up on how can we go virtual? Right, uh, and it sort of went, went, it sort of went from there. So I mean, I spent you know a lot of time in my basement working with a lot of gear, a lot of technology, did a lot of virtual talks. Look, people came to hate virtual mm. keynotes, and I'm now back on the road. I mean, I go to Houston next week. I was in Dublin a few weeks ago. Orlando, I just go back from Hawaii. I go to Houston again. Orlando again. I'm gonna be back in Ireland, going to the UK. Right. Uh, you got to get it. Uh, you you got to get me into um. Uh, South Africa to talk to some corporate groups and anybody listening absolutely fit dot international uh, and that's where you and I will come in and do a you know I'll do a keynote you'll do a sort of a fitness mental health mindset uh, your story talk and we will right. rock your corporate world um, so I'm back in you know in-person events and it's kind of fun fan fantastic but I still love coming down here into this virtual broadcast studio and doing things right. so where does that that mindset and that attitude come from because I think it's like times were tough. I mean, I know for us, we lost 70% of our business in one day, oh, I, you know, and for you, it, it I, must have been a shock. 100%. I mean, I, I went yeah. from having a bunch of confirmed corporate gigs, and you have to understand the fee I get is significant, to nothing. Mm. Uh, and to me, it was a choice. It was, it was look, I, you know, I, I, I think I, I, I decided long ago to double down on optimism. Right. Uh, I, if, I, if I'm to be in a world that's going to involve fast change, and I'll talk to a lot of my corporate clients about fast change, I've got to be optimistic. I mean, what's the alternative? I've also been through, uh, you know, as you know, a number of uh, different uh, personal circumstances which have led to, you know, doubling down on that optimism in a very big way. Uh, so I think it's part of my psyche. I think it's part of my mindset. And I think it's part of the story that I take to the stage that, look, I, I, observe that you know some people see the future and see a threat innovators see the same future and see an opportunity and that's yeah. an optimism mindset it's got to be i mean if you want to be successful you've got to decide core number one issue in your mind is you have to have a positive outlook regardless of what is going on so is that something do you feel that you were, you were born with you've had your whole life was it something that you realized you had to develop no, I, I, I think I developed it over time. I mean, I remember shortly after marrying my wife and it's, you know, 1989, 88, and I'm in this, you know, firm and we've, you know, undergone a merger and, you know, all of a sudden I've gone from, you know, traveling the world, talking about the power of global connectivity and collaboration and sort of free internet stuff to fighting political battles in this bureaucratic company. And I remember taking the train in every every morning, you know, into Toronto with my wife and just like getting into a foul mood. Like, who would want to hire me? What are my skills? What can I possibly mm. do? Um, you know, that was probably one of the one of the moments I've had a few, you know, where the lowest of the low. And, you know, I sort of figured a way out. I mean, I was able to, you know, quit my job because she had a fantastic career and solid income. And I was able to jump out on my own and make the terrifying leap into entrepreneurship and doing my own thing. Right. Uh, and. You know, I did have the good fortune of, of writing a national bestseller and having life explode from that point. Right. That's... There's been a few instances along the way. I mean, post dot com collapse, recession yep. of 2001. I mean, my business collapsed. It went like that um, again. And what we did at that moment in time was my wife and I, you know, took up skiing with our young sons because I decided, number one, I got to keep my head screwed on right. I mean, I can't right. sit around and you know, complain about the fact that business has collapsed. Let's number one, take care of mental health. And from that will flow the optimism and that will flow from, you know, another business reinvention. So how important is 
prioritizing yourself to success? I'd say it's pretty darn important. I mean, I, I remember, you know, late 1999, something like this. This is when the dot-com years were blowing up and, you know, people were suddenly becoming millionaires in these stock plays. And yep. I had the opportunity to do that. And instead, we were, my wife and I were driving with our sons to Washington to go see the Air and Space Museum, you know, full of spaceships. And I was, you know, realizing that it's more important to double down and being a great dad and, and, you know, the love for my wife and doing the right things as opposed to chasing the money. Right. Uh, and I think I've had a few lessons like that along the way that it's more important to be successful by understanding the roots of your success than to be successful by trying to chase some image of success. Right. If that makes any sense. So, it does, I mean, that speaks to gratitude, right? Oh, gosh, yes. I mean, I, 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 I'm thankful every freaking day. That's a Canadian phrase, freaking. Um, yeah. You know, I get up and, you know, these pinch me moments and you know, I, I'm 64. I mean, I realize I'm sort of probably on the sunset of my career. You know, if I can get out and do this for a good five more years or something, I'll be thrilled. Uh, Another 20 at least. Yeah. With, with absolute gratitude on, on yeah. you know, the fact I've done the right things and along the way I've, you know, mostly made the right decisions. I've doubled down on my optimism and things like that. Right. So if we talk sort of about what you speak about and what you do, AI is now quite a big part of that. And it's interesting to see because I, I see a lot of um, where we spoke about you coming out here and speaking to companies. I think it's absolutely vital because it, to any company in the world, you, for me as a small business and just running our small team in a couple of the businesses that we do, the prospect of what AI tools to use, how to use them correctly, what are legitimate tools uh, and it, it's terrifying and it's daunting. And you put out a post, uh, you shared a video, I think that you, you did at the um, the cattle, I want to say the cattle barons. Uh, well, <laughs> going back, the cattle barons, 3,000 okay. cattle ranchers, you know. Several yeah, the cattle barons, yeah. So, you know, we, you, you spoke about finding, you have to pick a partner, you, or you have to find advisors, the right guys to work with. I mean, how, how important is that? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm obviously, I'm spending a lot of time talking about AI. The, the thing mm -hmm. is, most people, most companies, most CEOs are not focused on the right thing when it comes to AI. I mean, everybody's talking about chat GBT and these image mm -hmm. generation tools and stuff like that. And that's important, but it's not everything that's going on. That's why I keep focusing on, if I, if I pull it up here, um, mm -hmm. the AI megatrends. You know, the, these are the, the, the big substantive long-term transformative trends. Um, right. I, can, I can move it over. I've got the capability okay. to do that. Yeah. which truly define our, our world. Um, okay. These are things like machine vision, um, machine um, uh, robotics, um, you yes. know, the ability to, um, to completely transform our business. So I've been talking about the AI megatrends, which go beyond chat GBT. And, you know, where is AI going to take us, you know, two years out, five years out, 10 mm -hmm. years out. And so, for example, I'm in Houston next week with a big, um, massive insurance conference, a whole bunch of CEOs. And I'm going to be talking about the fact that, you know, really where AI takes us is in the insurance industry is it turns it completely upside down. We're going from a world in which we underwrite insurance based on what you did in the past, so past driving behavior or yes. urine test, blood test for, for life insurance, to underwriting people in real time. I mean, if I got a blood pressure cuff and I've got a diabetes monitor, if I had, you know, mm. blood glucose and, you know, if you're monitoring my health in real time and I'm showing good numbers, you will underwrite my life insurance based upon that real time information. If I'm driving, wow. you're going to underwrite the car based upon my exact current driving performance. That the insurance industry completely upside down. And the same right. type of thing is happening in every single industry. The thing is with so many CEOs and senior executives focused on chat GBT and, you know, how do I search and yeah. And that's that's cool, but that's not the biggest part of what is happening out there. So okay. I'm, you know, last year, a lot of organizations were bringing a lot of speakers who did cool little talks on here's chat GPT, look at the cool things you did. Mm. Well, they're realizing, well, this is bigger than we thought. The Jim Carroll guys put it in perspective. Let's bring him in. Right. Absolutely. It, it It's because also I think you, you spoke quite a bit about the the, spe the speaker industry, the event industry, and, and how that is yeah. going to be affected and changed and it, it, it's, I, I it's missed, quite interesting yeah i missed you briefly there your voice dropped it oh so so the um just where you spoke about the speaking industry the events industry 
and how AI is going to help alter that and change that and empower be better production and better content. I, I think that's sort of a thing beyond um, AI. I mean, AI is playing a role in that, but I, I, I mean, I had this post where I was talking about the Taylor Swift effect. Look, I've got two daughters-in-law and they're Taylor Swift fans. And so I'm a, I've become a Swifty, you know, um, <laughs> she's a remarkably smart, intelligent businesswoman. But if you look at the Eras tour and you look at the staging and you look at the, the presentation and you look at the performance, and you look what's happening with the younger generations going to conferences. I mean, they zone out in the in the first two minutes if you're not engaging and interactive. So you've got to work really hard if you're doing any type of corporate event or association event or conference convention event to draw the attention of people. I call it the Taylor Swift effect. Yeah, we've got to have the best. We've got to have the best, you know, production. We've got to have the best content. You've got to be engaging. And the same thing holds true for virtual. I mean, that's why I can you know jump in my spaceship and you know talk from here. Um, right. you know, to, to you know, turn into completely different things, you know, using, utilizing the magic of all this technology. The world is changing. The tension spans are collapsing. People think differently. They act differently. And, you know, regardless of who you are and what you're doing, you've got to align um, to that reality. I mean, it's, you know, and here I am, you know, uh, uh, while we're talking, mm. perfect example of what's going on. I'm, I'm sitting here, an email came in and I'm zipping off, you know, while I'm talking to you to Look at the email. How rude is that? But that's the nature of our world today. When I'm on stage, yeah. I mean, right. I can see people looking at their phones. And so I'm yep. going to, how can I make those phones a part of my presentation by doing some text message polling, for example? Right. So how, on that point, how dangerous is it for CEOs and execs, your C-suite guys, to be following the trends that are popular, like ChatGPT, where they're giving all of their attention to that? Oh, very dangerous. Look, my mm. phrase, a guy like me is a phrase machine. Here's my favorite. Uh, we are now in a situation in which companies that do not yet exist will build products not yet conceived, using materials not yet invented, uh, with methodologies not yet in existence, with embedded AI intelligence right. uh, that is still being defined. I mean, that's the reality for any CEO. It doesn't matter if you're insurance, if you're banking, if you're manufacturing, if you're agriculture, uh, if you're some sort of science-based product organization, food, consumer products, I mean, there's some guy or some lady in a garage right now who's going to reinvent your entire business model with AI at the heart of it. And it doesn't right. involve necessarily chat GBT and the cool trends. Mm -hmm. It involves the big AI mega trends. And so that's what I've sort of been out there preaching. And I think that's what more and more people are starting to pay attention to. To pay, okay. Because this can, I mean, you know, sort of be as devastating to companies as cell phones and portable cameras were to Kodak. I mean, you, you can end, you can disappear very, very quickly. Yeah, I mean, you could be blockbuster right now and you're in that zone of complacency that you're not really yeah. thinking about right. what comes next. And that's why more and more of my events are corporate events where the CEO is starting to realize they've got big issues. They've got to, you know, you know educate their team, come up with a real plan. So, I mean, in Dublin, uh, I was with a global pharmaceutical clinical trial company. I mean, they did the clinical trials for for Pfizer, for the for the um, BioNTech Pfizer vaccine. They realized AI is going to fundamentally change their industry. Mm -hmm. And they realized they either should be the ones to define the future of the industry as it will be around AI, or they're going to be a follower. And so they found me and brought me in to give the opening kickoff to get them in the right mindset for this big you know, global corporate event that they had. And what is the, the results that you're seeing talking to people about this, talking to the CEOs, the C-suite execs? What, what is this having on them, this effect? Sort of before the talk, you talk to them and afterwards. What are they I saying mean, to I sort of at the cocktail party? I, I, can, I can point to organizations that get it. I can point to organizations that do not. I mean, I've got one right. company I'm watching that, you know, I went in sort of a, with a message that you could be Amazon. I mean, you're a wholesale business and you know, you could be in a situation in which, you know, what you are sell, an uh, Amazon type company could come in and do it in with a different business model. They're not doing well. Uh, they mm -hmm. didn't listen. The CEO was complacent, full of hubris, you know, full of a sort of an arrogant mindset. Um, I look at NASA. I mean, look what, you know, not, what happened last week where the, mm -hmm. this private commercialized space company landed on the moon. Uh, and when I was with NASA, the topic was the commercialization of space. And, you know, I mean, the mindset the first time I went in there was their mindset was only the Russian, Chinese and Americans are in the space industry. Some right. of them could not conceive that there would be hundreds or thousands of commercial space companies that would get in the business of space. 
Right. Uh, and, you know, and looking back, I think the senior leadership team at NASA did come to understand that in a very significant way. I've been with automotive companies that, you know, I look at them, to, to Chrysler, Daimler Chrysler, which was the merged mm -hmm. entity of Mercedes and uh, Chrysler. I mean, there's a lot of car company executives who are in just in denial. New York Times had a post just this morning that essentially Chinese electric car manufacturing companies are going to obliterate Detroit and Stuttgart and Tokyo mm -hmm. car manufacturing companies. Probably true because they're in that zone of complacency. Right. How do you keep your energy up? I mean, you've got incredible energy, incredible vitality. I love seeing your morning pictures. You're up early. What time do you start your day? How do you, how do you keep that energy and that passion and that drive? Because I know you say you're in your 60s, but you know you come across as someone who's in their 20s. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna pull up a picture. I got, I'll, I'll uh, give me a second here, and I'm gonna pull up the picture of what I sent you this morning. Yes. Uh, so you know, here I am at. Uh, uh, if I can, there I am. There's my uh, M and M moment at uh, you know <laughs> six fifteen this morning. Right. Um, you know, I I. Uh, what time are you up? You're like four four thirty. I look at your post and it's like, <laughs> yeah. oh, you know, Nick. Yeah. Sure. I'm I'm a five a.m. person. I mean, I discovered right. the the beauty, the joy of you know chasing the sunrise and the sun rising in splendor, as they say. Um, and it, it truly has transformed my view of the world. I mean, I get out there for a, a you know, seven, eight kilometer walk every morning as the sun comes right. up chasing the sunrise. And I just sort of sets the tone for the day. Right. Um, I used to be someone, you know, waking up later in the day and full of thoughts and recriminations and, you know, what happened the day before. I'm away from that now. Yeah. Uh, you know, absolutely wonderful. And I, I think, you know, I'm using a lot of that time rather than rushing into work. I'm using a lot of that time to think about what I need to be thinking about. Right, hundred percent. How how do you balance your sort of work life? Because I think, you know, when given what we've been through uh, w with COVID and when things shut down, and suddenly where, where business picks up, and you know, p people are realizing the value that you can bring, so you're in tremendous demand. But how do you make sure that you're not overworking? What do you use as your yardstick for balance? Her name is Krista. She's my wife of uh, 34 years. Um, you know, I mean, when I was young and stupid, I mean, I was doing three or four events a week. I'd be in San Diego and then L.A. and then, you know, Phoenix and then Las Vegas. And, you know, I'm on stage and I'm burning out and, and you know, not delivering the, the top performance I could have. And, you know, that came to an end. It, it had to come to an end because it was not going well for a, a certain period of time. Uh, and yeah, I mean, she helped convince me that, look, I mean, you're 64, buddy. You can't do that anymore. I mean... <laughs> You, you also manage it through your fee. I mean, it is not inexpensive yeah. to bring me in. If you look at my client list, if you look at my track record, mm. you look at the organizations that are booking me. I mean, I, it takes a very significant investment um, to bring me in. It, the client list shows that, you know, organizations find value in the investment. So, I mean, it's a number of things, but it's, it's probably having a good grounding with family and life balance and out, mm. outside activities, outside work and all those things. Right, a hundred percent. So, in terms of where you are, because you, you're very high up in terms of your your fees and what you charge, and obviously with the, the value that you deliver, how did your career start, and how did you get there? I, I was one of those uh, weird people. So, I um, graduated university just short of the age of nineteen. Um, what? I, you know, wow. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I was, a, I think, a weird kid. I, they kicked me out of grade two, I guess, because I was causing trouble. So they put me in grade <laughs> four. And, I, you know, I had stuff like that happening. So Were you, uh, were you correcting a, the teacher? Little, yeah, maybe I have a few little brain cells out there. So, I mean, yeah. I, you know, jumped straight into a career as an accountant. I was a Canadian chartered accountant at the age mm. of 21 and, you know, did a lot of stuff, accounting advisory, tax mm. business advisory, which gave me a firm business background. I mean, when I go in with a CEO... Um, you know, I mean, I do understand business strategy, financial, you know, all mm. that stuff, but it was, it was the discovery of what was happening with technology in 1982 that, you know, really defined my future. It's like that moment when Steve Jobs spoke to, um, um, uh, John Scully, you know, who was the CEO mm. of Pepsi. Do you want to sell sugared water the rest of your life? Or do you want to get in the ground floor of something that is going to transform society? And I think that's right. sort of the mindset as I had. And I had friends saying, what are you doing throwing away a perfectly good career as an accountant? Like, getting yeah. involved with this computer stuff, it's not going to go anywhere. And well, actually, it sort of did. Yeah, a little um, bit. <laughs> you know, a little bit. So, I mean, it was making some good decisions along the way. 
Right. Okay. And then, did, did you set sort of your value based on what you knew the value that the, your, your fear based on the value of what you knew you were delivering? Because I think for a lot of no, young I mean, speakers, I, I it's... Think, hmm? think about a 33-year career, Nick. I mean, I played yeah. the clubs. I mean, I had a lot yeah. of things in, you know, small events in Iowa, um, you know, right. small events in Saskatchewan, Canada, you know, with 50 people in the room. And, and you know, when you get to a, when you get to a, you know, an event where you're on a stage in Las Vegas, mm. uh, I can probably pull up um, an example clip and your name is up in, in, you know, big lights. Um, that doesn't yeah. happen overnight. Yes. Um, you know, that takes years. So I, if I show you this, I've got this one clip where um, I'm walking on stage to this massive conference. You, can, you ever notice that you can never find what you're looking for when you're looking for it? Always, um, particularly on always, a Mac. But, <laughs> well, no, it's just I, I didn't have this uh, queued up right. So here I have. Right. So if I um, I'm going to pull this in. I'm not sure the sound mm -hmm. is going to come through, but give me a moment, and you know we'll see what happens. So I'm, again, I'm going to go to a blank screen. It's going to go green for a moment. Cool. Uh, then I'll drag it in, and this is this is how weird my life became all of a sudden. Oops. Yep. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you know, that's that's what happened with me. I, I, I you know, remember walking out in that stage. It was Burger King's mm -hmm. Global Franchise Conference. They actually had Leonard right. Nimoy as Spock in the night before. So they built him, literally built him the bridge of the Enterprise. And I remember backstage and thinking, like, wow, it's finally happened. Yeah, that was in 2009. And that's right. when things really began exploding. And I could command a very significant fee. Okay, that's absolutely fantastic. Jim, just, you know, I know, I know we, we pressed a little bit for time. But for you, what sort of three things would you advise CEOs, C-suite execs to keep an eye on, to look out for? Uh, in, and maybe that's not looking at something uh, while looking at something else. I, I Number one, watch the next generation. You know, I mean, my sons are 28 and 30. They live in a different world. You know, any industry is the, you know, the 25-year-old who's grown up in a different era, different time, different world um uh, you know watch what they're doing understand what they're doing because they think act differently mm -hmm. um watch the people in the garages watch the edges you know a lot of the innovation the trends and the you know that are defining the future are occurring out there in the ubiquitous uh garage and kill your right. organizational sclerosis i mean a lot of organizations are stuck um you know they they i, I have a joke i tell on stage i think in a lot of organizations there's people who wake up in the morning and the very first thought that comes to their mind is, what am I going to do today to kill great ideas? I use it as mm. a joke, but it's probably true. Uh, right. I have a lot of organizations that are stuck in rut. Uh, and, you know, I, you know, Nick, my, my goal is to get on a stage with you over in South Africa. So hit us up at futurefit.international. I think right. that's the right website. And, you know, that's yep. where they can discover that you and I can come in together and do a, an absolutely um, fascinating little talk um 100 to help them do the right things they need to do to align to this faster future you know i think it, it it's so vital because i've seen from i spent 15 years in financial services and i've seen how those industries have changed when liberty launched its franchise model how many franchises there were that no longer exist and just guys stuck in how it was done 20 30 years ago and not as a sales pitch, but as a perfectly frank pitch in investing in you doing a talk by a company is in them is an investment ensuring that they're going to be around potentially in five to in five years, because that's how quickly things move. Oh, fantastic. Let me just move that out yeah, of the way. It, yep. you, I know you and I have talked about this for, for a long time and I, you know, yeah. I, 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 I am stunned by the complacency that exists out there with a lot of organizations. I'm stunned by how many organizations that thinks the way they're doing business today or the business model they have in place is what is going to exist tomorrow. That's not true. Uh, right. And the fact is change is happening faster than ever before. So you need to align yourself um, to, to that reality. So, you know, hopefully we can, uh, we can, you know, get together at, uh, you know, some event. Um, yep. 
Absolutely. You know, I know insurance is what, you know, insurance banking is one of your biggest sectors over there. And yes. look, I'm headlining a massive conference in Houston next week. I've got CEOs of most of the major world um, insurance companies in the room. And my message to, to them is the future belongs to those who are fast and, yeah. you know, are prepared to make, make big, bold moves. That's what organizations need to do. Absolutely. Your responsibility to your staff is to move fast. You know, that's, yes. yep. yeah, to look after them. You know, that's a fantastic point uh, to end on. You know, I really do appreciate your time and uh, thank you so much. And I'm just going to end the recording and then we'll chat quickly. Thank you, Jim. Appreciate you being okay. here.